Heavenly Father, you have made us your children through your spirit. In your kindness, you adopted us and delivered us from sin and death. For you did not give us the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption to whom we can cry out, Abba. Remind us today what it means to be your child and to be free from that law. It is so easy for us to live our days on our own terms, but help us to live in the light of your grace. Father, we pray that our families and friends will have a beautiful day. Help them to experience your love as their father and feel their inheritance in your spirit. Thank you for accepting us as we are, but not leaving us the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm just now seeing you guys' comments. Good morning. Good morning. No problem, Pamela. Okay, so we're going to be going through two chapters today of Esther since last week just didn't work out with my tooth and everything and um I am doing much better basically I'll quickly tell you guys the situation with that I went in for a root canal and because apparently my roots are or my canals rather are very curved and super long it was difficult for the dentist to do it so she basically told me to go to a specialist and intodontist that specializes in root canals the one that they referred to me did not take my insurance so i had to find a new one found that one but now i have to fax the referral to this place so i was hoping to get it finished this week but i don't know so we're just gonna pray that there's no pain i still have my pain medicine just in case but that's basically what happened last week, why I could not um, do the study because they only um, did two canals and apparently I have two or three more canals in my tooth that need to be done. Um, so yeah, I have some special teeth. <laughs> but I have all of my things for today. So I have my post-it, my large one, the blue one. Let me move the comments out the way. I have my little donut as well as my little unicorn my highlighters and stuff so the Crayola Twistables as well as the super tips and then all of my highlighters which are the zebra mild liners and then the sharpie smear guards and I have a few new pens um, I went to Michaels so I've recently been using this pen it's the Micron 01 archival ink pen and this bad boy is extremely extremely fine it is a 0.25 you guys i don't even know if it's gonna focus it's a 0.25 like do you see that thing you guys let me show you guys compare it to a point i think this is a 0.7 or 0.5 but you guys do you see the difference in that they kind of remind me of the Sharpie pens. I don't know if you guys know about those. I only know about these from when um, I was planning. But they're even finer than the Sharpie pens. I was going to get the 05, which I think is a .45. But it's so close to a .5 that when I saw these, I went for it. And um, I like it. I mean, $20 for a six-pack. I don't know how I feel about that. But um, I did use a 40% off coupon when I got it. So... awesome Stacy awesome yeah Latoya um it, it's a good pen um I don't know let me I can show you guys quickly before we start because I recently started studying Mark I, I stopped Isaiah altogether because it was so confusing but um I don't know it writes really really small if you guys can see like it writes super fine and super small um, so I like that, but I don't know, I'm still, I don't know, I guess I have to get used to it since I'm used to certain pins, I guess. But we're going to try this one out today and see how it works in this Bible. So we're going to start off with chapter 7. It's only 10 verses for chapter 7, and then if I'm not mistaken, there are 17 for chapter 8. So 27 verses today. We may go over two hours, we'll see. I don't think we should, but every time I say that, we always end up going over the time, so. Um, I'm going to remove these post-its for a second so that they are not in my way. Okay. 
All right, so we left off with um, Haman's wife telling him back in chapter 6, verse, I think, 13. Yeah, that basically if Mordecai was a Jew, that he wouldn't be able to kill him. He would be overcome by him. So now we're on to chapter 7, which is titled Esther Reveals Haman's Plot. What I call this um, for the study was God's punishment and deliverance because this is when we see Haman receiving the ultimate punishment from God and God delivering his people at the same time. And I apologize if I don't answer your comments right away. I have it cut off from the screen. And for some reason on my phone, the comments are going slow. And I can't look on my laptop because I have the notes open. So, yeah. <laughs> so, we're just going to read through um, verses 1 through 6. Yeah, 6. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half, the, half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. When Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and for my people. I'm sorry. Let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For if, sorry, verse 4, for we have been sold and I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slave men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss of the king. Verse 5, then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. So now we're going to go through. So I'm just going to circle the words that I personally defined. And obviously this was this is the time where you guys would have circled the words that you personally wanted to define. And um, for those who plan to watch this later in the group or even on YouTube if you watch this. What I circle and what I write you don't have to specifically circle and write. Um, these are just my personal notes. Um, so I do prefer that you guys you know, also have your own notes. Now you can. I'm not saying that you can't. But um, don't just take my notes as is go back read it for yourself look for words that you personally want to define so of course we might have similar things but sometimes or majority of the times it's always different so i just wanted to state that for those of you who plan to watch this later on or for those who will be watching this on youtube so i'm gonna go in and circle the word granted fulfilled and yes these are all words that i do know but I'm circling them anyway. Um, I think affliction, yes, affliction and foe. I think that was it. Oh, and terrified. I didn't have many words for this since it was so such a short chapter. But um, I basically circled granted, fulfilled, affliction, foe, and terrified. And I will put those definitions um, on here. So for granted, it's to permit as a right, privilege, or favor to allow fulfillment of for a person. So I'm just going to write all my definitions on here. Sorry about the camera shaking. And I know that the camera goes um, in and out with the focus, so I will show you guys and move my hand once I'm done writing. So. To permit as a right. I really like the way this pen writes, but I don't know. Eh. It's one of those up in the air decisions when you're used to something and then you switch to a new pen.
Okay, then we have fulfilled. Okay, I can't write on top of this one, this uh, Bible. So fulfilled is providing or feeling of happiness and satisfaction. Affliction. You know, I realize this pen says that it's waterproof as well and fade proof, so I think I want to try that out. Probably like write on a piece of paper and wet it to see how it works. Affliction is great suffering. A foe. One who has a personal anonymity for another. An adversary. And then terrified. To be filled with terror. Okay. Let's get some color on this page. What? Which ones do I want to play with? I'm going to use this brown. How many do I have? Five. So I'm using this brown mild zebra liner. With the word foe. I will say I like that when I do highlight over it, it doesn't smudge, which is definitely a plus for me because I hate when my pens and stuff smudge after I highlight. I don't like that. Actually, let me just color in the box because it's irritating me not coloring in the box. this vermilion color for these I'm not gonna color in the box just because they're a little heavier and darker but okay so granted is to permit as a right privilege or favor allow fulfillment of for a person the field is providing or feeling of happiness and satisfaction affliction is great suffering foe is one who has a personal enmity for another or adversary or adversary if you want to say it like that and then terrified is to be filled with terror so those are the definitions move that to the side now going into underline let me just check the comment section quickly yes congrats leona Sorry, Leona. I don't know why I said Leona. <laughs> Leona. Oh my God. Really, I've been definitely been praying for you. So I can definitely now move that to my answered prayer section. That is so awesome. Good morning, Nora and Tanya. Sorry if you guys, if I'm like com like answering your comments after the fact. It's because I'm trying to keep it out of the screen. Because for some reason, it makes my screen look 
darker than what it is so I have to move it so that I can see all the light but that is so awesome okay so to find those now we're gonna underline so so the king and Haman went to, into the feast with Queen Esther and I'm just gonna underline that whole thing and my note this is when sticky notes become a problem just because there's so much that I want to write but not a lot of space so we're gonna go with that and on this I'm actually gonna use a sharpie pen so here's a sharpie pen it's like a marker but it's not gonna seep as badly or kind of like I don't know what the word is I'm looking for but it's not as bad as using like a sharpie marker um, so verse one So, um, so the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. So basically, a feast usually suggests victory, joy, or security. So for Haman, for him to attend this after, you know, all the stuff that he's been planning and wanting to tell the king, it seemed like he had victory and that he would succeed in his evil schemes. But in all actuality, this was really a victory feast for Esther um, because God would save the Jews from Haman's evil plan. So... That's why I underlined that. Sorry, guys. That's why I underlined it. So, uh, a feast usually, and I already have the printables available. I just have to put them in a PDF file and send them to you guys. But I, I normally wait till after because sometimes, um, I get what people call a spiritual download and. There are certain things that God will tell me as I am leading these Bible studies that I want to include on the printables before saving them as a PDF file. So, so again, a feast usually suggests victory, joy, or security. To Haman, he succeeded. And his evil plans, or schemes, plot, whatever you want to say. However, and you guys know I shorthand my notes when I'm putting them inside of the bible but on the printables you'll have the full thought that i was thinking as i wrote them out however this is a victory yeah, for esther as god would save the jews all right, so again, a feast usually suggests victory, joy, or security. To Haman, this seemed like he had victory and would succeed in his evil scheme, so he basically felt secure and happy now that he was going to attend this feast. However, this was more of a victory feast for Esther as God would save the Jews from Haman's evil plans or schemes or plot, whatever you want to call it. All right, so let's get some color on this paper. I think I'm just going to stick to these two pens for today and put away my other ones. Um, and the other ones I normally use are the Pentel RSVP pens, the fine points. I think the fine points are 0.7 or 0.5. I don't really remember through the packaging out. But I do have this pen here, which is a Zebra ballpoint 0.7 millimeter pen. And... Um, I have the ballpoints and the gel. I haven't really used the ballpoint. I use the gel a lot, but I have it because I do want to try it out. But, okay. Let's get some color in here. Let's use this pink, I guess, because it's right here in front of me. Pink. Alrighty. So, 
moving on to verse 2. Um, I basically underlined that whole quote of him asking him, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request even to have my kingdom? It shall be fulfilled. So I'm just underlining that whole thing. Basically, this is once again Esther receiving favor from the king because she has so much favor from God. Um, and we've seen him ask this previously. So, let me put this pen to the side and get this. I think this is verse 2, right? Yeah, verse 2. Once again... Esther receives favor. From the king. Because. Of the favor. She has from God. I have cross references. I have three. Yes, I have three. So, see Esther 5, verse 3 and 6. And then there's Philippians 4 and 6. So, again, um, verse 2 with him asking, What is your wish, Queen Esther? She will grant it. What is your request? Even to have my kingdom, it shall be, it shall be fulfilled. Once again, Esther receives favor from the king because of the favor she has from God. And we can see that this has happened before to her back in chapter 5. Which, if I could find where chapter 5 is. <laughs> it's on this side, apparently. Okay, so 5 and 3. I have to figure this out. Like, I have such a big desk. But when you start to work on your desk, it's like your desk is never big enough. But um, 5, 3, and 6. Yeah, we see that he asked that same question again back in chapter 5, verse 3, where it says, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to have my kingdom. And then in verse 6, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request even to have my kingdom? It shall be fulfilled. So he's asked her this three times, which really shows the amount of favor that she has with him. And then I have Philippians 4 and 6. Philippians, let's get to Philippians. So Philippians 4 and 6, which is like an infamous kind of thing. Um, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Which she did do, as you guys know, she and um, the Jews that lived in the Persian Empire had a three-day fast. So she was able to not be anxious, and she already made her request known to God. So mm -hmm. she, again, received more favor for that. And my phone is on vibrate, and it's vibrating. I don't like that, so put it on silent. Alrighty. So some color. Let's do purple or lavender rather. Because that's what it looks like. Moving on to verse 3. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king. So I think that was the first one that I underlined. So, yes, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king. And then on another note, I underlined, Let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. So verse 3 has two parts to it.
Okay, let me go get another post-it note because I'm going to need it. Sorry, guys. Um, you know what? We're just going to take out the infamous owl and coffee cup <laughs> and use those. I was going to get a regular post-it, but let's use the owl. I don't think I used the owl in a while, have I? Nope. So let's go with a Crayola twistable pencil. If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king. And let's use this teal color. Oh, well, I guess I got the green instead of teal by accident, whatever. Let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. Who is this calling the house phone? I do not know. Alrighty. So the first portion for verse 3. And I'm using this yellow. Okay, so the first portion for verse 3. Um, where it says, if I found favor in your sight, O king. And if it pleases the king. So basically, Esther is mindful of how she approaches her request while still showing respect to her king. She's not showing any signs of nervousness or panicking. So, you know, she's in this kind of desperate situation, but she's not worried about it. She's not anxious, as we have seen when I um, cross reference back to Philippians 4 and 6, because she already made her request known to God and she trusted that God would see it through. So she's basically being mindful with how she speaks to the king. And this is something that Esther does a lot um, throughout the book of Esther when she speaks to the king, even though he's her husband, even though she herself has power as a queen, she is still mindful of him as a man, as a king, and also as her husband. So she respects authority and understands her position. And that's not to, to say it in a negative light, because I know a lot of women don't like um, hearing that. But back in this time, that was um, very key, because as we've seen in chapter one, Queen Vashti was not like that, um, at least in the chapter that we read of her. So I think that was very key to remember. So Esther is mindful. Of how she approaches her request. And keep in mind, it took her a while to even get to her request. Because he's asked her this back in chapter 5. And we go to chapter 6 and now 7. So it took two chapters. You know. To, for her to really even stay her request. And I have cross references for that as well. Joshua 1 9. But let me just do this. Okay, so again, for that first part, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, I put that Esther is mindful of how she approaches her request while still showing respect. Um, see Esther 5 and 8. So let's scoot this over. Five and eight. If I have found favor in the sight of the king and if it pleased the king. So the note that I had here was that Esther is intentional. She speaks with reverence and honor and she understands her role. So it's the same kind of idea in this verse. And then I have Joshua 1 9. I have no idea what the book of Joshua is, you guys. Like, So we're going to flip through this together to find it. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's prior to all of this. Yes. I feel like I should start marking up where my cross-references are again. But half the time, I don't figure out my cross-references until prior to. Yes, Joshua's here. Joshua 1-9. Okay. So here it is. It says, have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So not only is she mindful, not only is she not anxious because she made her request known, but she trusts that God is going to be there for her when she needs him. So I just thought that was key. And then for the second portion, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. So she didn't immediately identify herself as a Jew. She, um, sorry, hold on. She, okay, sorry. I just had to reread the note because the way I wrote it. But, um, okay, so she did not immediately identify herself as a Jew, which they were targeted for the massacre, um, which is kind of how Haman did it. He didn't identify the group of people he targeted when he made his request. So she's showing wisdom in how she framed her request and appealed on a personal basis, knowing that she has never done anything but please the king. And then the cross-reference I have for that is Esther 3.8, and I think that was when... Um, Haman made his request to the king. Yeah, see, if you look back in Esther 3, 8 here, it says, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other person, and they do not keep the king's law, so it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. So he never said Jews, you know, he said certain people. And with Esther, she's just saying, my life and my people. So neither one of them really revealed who these people were being the Jews. So she definitely um, kind of went about it the way Haman did and keeping the identity secret. But she also used godly wisdom in doing so and not that earthly kind of prideful wisdom. So... Uh, So for what I'm going to add in here, I just put that she did not immediately reveal her identity as a Jew. She made her request with wisdom. So moving on to four. And I'm going to take that sticky note off because we're going to need that later. So four. Um, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. So, I'm underlining that. And then I'm also going to underline, if we had been sold merely as slaves, I would have been silent. Is what I'm going to underline. I'm going to check you guys' comments in a sec. So. I'm sorry guys with my hands all in the camera. <laughs> so verse 4. I don't want to write it on here because I don't have a lot to say. Let me see. Actually I do. Yep, I surely do. I don't need a coffee cup. <clears throat> verse 4, the first portion of that. And I use the pink, right? Yep.
So for that, um, so for we have been sold, I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. So this is now Esther revealing that Haman plotted to kill her people and planned to pay the king as the king, wait, huh? Oh, plan to pay the king, as he mentioned, to do so to the king's treasury. So basically, um, she's revealing now Haman's plot that was told to the king back in Esther 3.9. So, Esther reveals Haman's plot. against her people see Esther 39 and I'm not gonna flip to that um cuz I just read 38 so yeah <laughs> but you guys get the gist of it so The next portion where it says, if we had been sold merely as slaves, I would have been silent. So basically, being sold as a slave would have been fine for her, as God has done that to her people as punishment before. But to be killed is not of God's desire for her people. Th which tells me that she knew the word um, and knew what was right of her people. And she knew God's types of punishments toward her people. So she basically knew who God was. She knew God. Um, she understood that. And I think that is very important because when we face certain things in our lives, we don't always tend to remember who God is. We immediately get down and out. Like, I know for me, if I have to pay for something and I don't have the money, especially because I don't have an actual nine to five job, I start to stress myself out. I start to get worried. I start to try to figure things out on my own. But I don't have to do that because I have a God who's a provider. He makes provisions for me. He um, sustains me. So she remembers who he is. Whereas me, it takes me a minute to remember who he is half the time. Because I just immediately get stressed out and worried. So Esther was definitely a woman um, of God. Like she truly was. So I'm going to write... And I do have cross references for that as well. I'm trying to figure out how I want to shorthand this note. <laughs> okay, so being a slave would be fine as God punished her people this way. So shorthanded note of what I just said is basically that being a slave would have been fine as God punished her people this way before, but to be killed was not his desire for his children. Then I have the cross reference of Genesis 28 verses 48 and 68. So let's flip to that. 28 verses 's clearly see this this is the problem that I have so I feel like I put the wrong <laughs> I definitely did put the wrong cross reference was it 38 and not 28 <laughs> Okay, scratch that cross-reference. I need to figure out the proper cross-reference. So let me just grab my Bibles. <laughs> and I don't 
don't know which Bible I saw that cross-reference in because I look in all of my Bibles when studying. What verse is that? I'm sorry, you guys. This is real life study problems that I have. No, not this Bible. Was it this Bible? Okay. See, okay, so I figured it out. It's not Genesis, it's supposed to be Deuteronomy. And this pillow is doing too much. So it's Deuteronomy 28. Sorry guys. <laughs> so Deuteronomy 28. And let me actually fix that note in here before I mess that up. So it's Deuteronomy. Let me fix that right now. Okay. Okay, so Deuteronomy twenty eight, forty eight, and sixty eight. So forty eight is the where. Okay. So Deuteronomy 28 and 48 says, Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness, lacking everything. He will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. So basically you'll be shackled as slaves. And then 68. And the Lord will bring you back in the ships to Egypt, a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. So being a slave would have been normal for her people because she understood and knew, you know, the lifestyle of her people. I mean, obviously, they're all scattered around the Persian Empire. But to be killed, destroyed, annihilated completely, she understood that that was not of God's will and God's desire. So... Let me check you guys' comments now. No problem, Nora. Feel better. Thank you, Tanya. I'm just now seeing your um your comment. Yeah, definitely. I don't know why I had Genesis, but it's definitely Deuteronomy. Okay. So moving on to five, I underlined where it said, let me move these pins out of my way. Where it says, who is he and where is he? Who has dared to do this? So for that, I'm going to write that note over here. And then just stick this unicorn here. Okay. So for five, who is he and where is he? Who has dared to do this? Basically, the king himself doesn't realize that he's the one that actually signed away on that decree to annihilate the Jews. Um, because he was basically ignorant to the plan of Haman. So he's very furious, but I feel like he should be upset with himself because he unknowingly signed that off. He agreed to that. So, Ignorant to Haman's plot. So though it definitely was Haman's fault, um, the king should have asked more questions, I feel, 
to truly understand who this enemy was and that's a problem that happened back in those times um they really just heard enemy heard that they were different and wanted to kill rather than find out more information about these people i think if he would have asked more questions he would have found out that it was the jews but god doesn't do anything by mistake um ignorant to Haman's plan the king signed off on this I hate when I get to the bottom of my page my hand writing starts to look like chicken scratch let's use this lime green so that I can still see my notes or rather regular green because that was lime green up there And then for verse 6, I have two points, so. It says, and Esther said, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. So I'm underlining that. And I'm also going to underline Haman was terrified before the king and queen. brown because Haman is evil and that's just what I want to incorporate and use and then this blue okay so, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Basically, Esther exposed the truth about Haman. He was not a faithful servant of the king, as he was more interested in his own fame and status than the benefit of the king. So, that's what I'm going to write. Let me move that for a second. Esther exposed the truth about Haman. Why am I writing with this pen? <laughs> I know something was off. Should be writing with the Sharpie. And then for the last part where it says Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Um, basically, he never considered or imagined the queen being a Jew. Now he stood before the king, rightly accused of plotting murder against the king's wife. So... And there we have it. So that's verses 1 through 6. I'm going to stick this back here. Stick this one here.
here. And then stick that sticky note. Oh my gosh, there was like nowhere to put any of these. And you have so many glorious notes. And then I said I had to put these puppies back. This is so funny when you have way too many notes and have nowhere to stick them. Okay, there we go. I'm probably going to have to rewrite these notes on a large sticky note because that's way too many on there, but we're going to work it out. So now we're going to read 7 through 10, and then we're going to jump into chapter 8. Okay. <laughs> yes, Stacey, they definitely are. Like, I can't even, like, I have, this is, oh my gosh. I'm trying to get it so that it doesn't lift up while I'm trying to write on the other side. Okay. I'm just trying to keep it down, guys. <laughs> Alright. So, the last portion. And, of course, I can't zoom in. I probably should have zoomed in. But that's okay. Alright, so, 7 through 10. Let's just read it through. And the king arose in his wrath from, oh, and it's entitled, Haman is hanged. And the king arose in his wrath from wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. Verse 8, and the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine. As Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, and the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance to the king, said, Moreover, moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at the standing at Haman's house fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. So I'm just going to circle abated because that's literally the only word that I wanted to define. And I'm going to write that word definition here. And it's decrease in intensity. So decrease in intensity. But I mean, the last part of chapter 7, we see now that Haman is now repaid what he is due, or he's rather reaping what he sowed. So I already circled the one word, which was abated, decrease in intensity, and let's just use this yellow. Okay. Going back, let's underline. And let me charge my laptop before that cuts off on me. Didn't even know it was done. Alrighty. So I'm going to underline that um, the king arose in his wrath from wine drinking. And went into the palace garden, so... Arose in wrath from wine drinking and went into the palace garden. Then I'm also going to underline that Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. Okay. So arose in his wrath from wine drinking and went into the palace gardens, as well as Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. So. The king is rightfully angry for so many reasons with Haman's deceptions and plan. He now realizes that Haman, who he trusted, basically played him. And there's a cross-reference for that. So, mm. 
king rightfully angry. Haman played and betrayed him. I do have a cross reference, which is Proverbs 22. I hope you guys can see that. The king is rightfully angry. Haman played and betrayed him. The cross reference is Proverbs 20, verse 2. The terror of a king is like the growling of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger forfeits his life. Which we have read and seen that that takes place. And then for Haman's day to beg for his life um, from Queen Esther, my note for that is now Haman is now forced into hum humility by having to plead for his life with the Jew when all he wanted to do was kill them. His evil plans have basically reached their end. And I do have a cross reference for that. So let me write my note. Um, Haman forced into humility. Pleaded with a Jew for his life. Evil plans ended. See Proverbs 16? Yes, 16 and 4. Again, though I'm shorthanding my notes, you'll have the actual full length notes in the printable. I need some color on here. My eyesight is not working. <laughs> so let's use this green. And I'm going to read that cross-reference in a second. I just need color. I love me some color. It makes everything better. And let's use this smoky blue color. So the cross reference I have is Proverbs 16 and 4. So let's get to that. 16 and 4 reads, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. I don't think I like it in that translation. <laughs> Let me get my King James Bible. You know, certain things just sound better in certain translations. So in the King James, it says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. So um, even evil people have a purpose. And I stated this back in Esther 2, I think it was, when they introduced him. No, it was 3. Okay. Yeah, in Esther 3. Okay, so... 3-1, the note that I had that you guys probably have as well as that. I said, Haman is ungodly, but God had use of his promotion. Shows that God can use the unwise and ungodly to fulfill his purpose. And we see what that purpose was. His purpose um, basically was to encourage the Jews as well as to position Mordecai where he is, which you'll read further in um, chapter 8 when we get to that shortly. But, um, yeah. 
and set this Bible over here. So that's that. Moving on to verse 8. I have three points. Yes, I have three points for verse 8. So, um, I'm going to underline as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. From verse 8. Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, and then I will underline. Will he even assault the queen in my presence? In my own house? And also as the words left the mouth of the king. They covered Haman's face. Okay. So as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. Um, so basically, we already know from verse 7 that all he really was doing was pleading for his life, begging Esther for mercy, basically. He wanted to receive mercy and grace, which is something that he wasn't even himself willing to give to Mordecai or the Jews. Um, so, he may have intended to beg, but when God protects his people, he makes sure those against them suffer. So, though he intended to just beg for his life... It's kind of as if, and I've, I've done my research on this, and I've seen that a lot of theologians believe that one of the angels had basically pushed Haman into Esther to make it seem as if he was trying to assault her. Now, that's what I looked up when I'm, um, I was researching it because I thought it was very profound, and there wasn't a lot of like notes in my study Bibles, and I have plenty of study Bibles. But when I researched it and realized that a lot of theologians agreed to the fact that it could have been an angel that had pushed Haman, I really thought about it, and it makes sense. God will go to the greatest extent to save his people. And we know that angels are neither good nor bad. They just do the will of God. So if God says to kill, they kill. If he says to save, they save. They don't do in between. They just follow the word of God. So I don't know. I just think it's quite interesting that some people believe that an angel pushed him. But I'm not going to say that because I don't know if that's like proper or correct. So I don't want to give you guys incorrect information. But um, that is something that I did find in my research. And it kind of makes sense when you look at it. But... I'm just going to say that Haman intended to beg, but when God protects his people, he makes sure that those against them suffer. So, Haman, I don't want to say intended because he did beg, but I'm just going to say it anyway, intended to beg, but... I'm sorry if you guys hear that sound. I'm not sure if it's coming across, <laughs> but I have my diffuser on right now. So if you hear it, I apologize. Um, what was I at? Okay, against them suffer. And that is for that. And I'm going to use yellow for this one just because I had to go across. Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? So, for all of Haman's pleading, he only got in deeper trouble because the fall looked as if he personally was assaulting the queen. Someone else is calling me, but we're going to decline that because I don't want to answer. <laughs> so, let's... Hmm. I'm going to take brown and this red. So for all his pleading,
kind of reminds me like when you try to um like say like when you're a kid and you've done something terrible in school um and you know when they say i'm gonna call your parents and they tell your parents and your parents tells you tell you like when you get home i'm gonna get you it's kind of like that situation and that um i feel like he should have gotten up when the king got up instead of trying to plead with the queen that's where Heyman personally went wrong i mean i think i feel like he would have died either way but at least he would have died with a little bit of dignity <laughs> like i feel like he should have just got up with the king walked out with the king and tried to talk to the king but no you stayed with the queen alone and ended up falling on top of her but you made it look like you tried to assault her so you put yourself in more trouble at least try to talk your way out of trouble with the king not the queen so we're gonna just drag this here As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Um, so basically his head was covered as preparation for execution. That's pretty much it. And there is a cross-reference for that. And I'm going to check that cross-reference before I tell you guys. Um, so... He was prepared... Like, I feel like he would have had extra time if he would have went after the king to talk to him. But no, he decided he wanted to stick around and um, beg with the queen. You accidentally fall on top of her. It looks like you're assaulting her. And now you're not even going to get a chance to state your case. Now you just have to die. They're preparing your head to be cut off. Like, that's just it. Um... Let me just check this cross-reference quickly. The cross-reference I have is Job 9.24. Yes, okay, so Job 9.24, if you guys can see here, it says, The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. It is not he who then is it. Let me read that again in the King James. So, Job 924. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? Um, I'm going to elaborate on this towards the end. Just because I don't remember where my notes are for that. But um, that definitely is a cross-reference as far as like covering your faces before execution. So, you can just write that down and also just research it for yourselves. But it is... Job it's 924 when you get the printable um when I upload it it'll have all the information on it obviously <laughs> um okay Verse 9, then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words save the king. So, I have, moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words save the king, is standing at Haman's house. Well, I'm not going to underline the rest of that. Um, and then I'm also going to underline the king said hang him on that. I'm going to go down to 10 and underline they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. And then I'm also going to underline then the wrath of the king was abated. 
And we're going to get some color in here. So let's use some gray. More over the gallows that Heyman had prepared for Mordecai. Who the words? Da, 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 da. That one. Let's get some orange. King said, hang up on that. Then the wrath of the king faded and some blue. Okay. So verse nine. write chapter 7 at the top so that I know which one this is for. So verse 9, moreover the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai whose word, save the king, is standing at Haman's house. Um, so now as he is being prepared for his death, his other plot to use the gallows on Mordecai is revealed. There is an emphasis on Mordecai having saved the king. So not only did you plan to um, not only did you betray me and lie to me and play me but now you're trying to kill the very man that saved the king's life so um as he is prepared or death his plot against Mordecai is revealed. Emphasis on Mordecai. Having saved the king. Life. And also again verse 9. You know what? Let's just highlight that whole box on. With the gray. I think this one was orange. Okay. So, um, as he prepared for death, his plot against Mordecai is revealed. There is an emphasis on Mordecai having saved the king's life. So, to begin with, you now have Esther revealing that he planned to kill her and her people. And as he's now having his head covered, prepared for execution, you have Harbona revealing the second part to his plot, which was to kill Mordecai. Um, and the king said, hang him on that. So, basically, it's the final act of humiliation. Revenge caused Haman's reputation to be damaged beyond repair, and he became trapped in his own devices. And then I have cross-references for that. So, I'm going to write... Final act... Of humiliation... Revenge caused his reputation, and I'm going to specifically say with the king, to be damaged beyond repair. You know how sometimes you can do something to hurt somebody and they can forgive you for that? But this is like you've gone beyond the strikes. Like you lied to him, you bribed him, you tried to kill the queen, you tr basically assaulted the queen in his presence, you betrayed him, and then now you're trying to kill the guy that saved his life. Like this, that's too many straws for the king. So it's damage beyond repair.
became trapped I'm gonna check you guys' um, comments in a second <laughs> became trapped by his own devices The cross references are Psalms 37 28 and then Proverbs 26 27. And I'm going to quickly read that in the King James translation just because I have this extra Bible here. So Psalms 37 and 28. So Psalms 27, I mean 37, 28, for the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off, which basically is what's getting ready to happen to poor old Haman. And then Proverbs 26 and 27, and there are definitely other cross references that you definitely can check out, but um, these are like the two that I saw in my Bibles. So 26 and 27, um, whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. So, you know, you dug a, you dug a ditch, you can't get out. You tried to roll somebody over, and hit, you tried to hit somebody with a car, you got hit with a car. Kind of like that. Um, that just made no sense, but I hope that you get the point of what I was saying. <laughs> okay, so let's just finish off with verse 10. I'll check you guys' comments, and then we'll jump into chapter 8. So for verse 10, um, so they hanged him on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Basically, Haman found his end on the same instrument he intended for the death of Mordecai. He was caught in his own trap against Mordecai. The trap you plan for God's anointed and his chosen will be turned in use for you. So, let me get the blue going first. So Haman found his end by the instrument he planned to kill Mordecai with. The trap or plan you want to use for God's anointed slash chosen Will be turned and used for you. And then I have several <laughs> cross references. So I have Psalms seven sixteen, Psalms ninety four twenty three. Proverbs 11, 5 through 6. Proverbs 29, 16. And Daniel 6, 24. So, it says, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for himself. Or, I'm sorry. They hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Haman found his end by the instrument he planned to kill Mordecai with. The trap or plan you would want to use for God's anointed or chosen will be turned and used for you. And then the cross references. So starting off with Psalm 7, 16. Seven sixteen, seven sixteen, and it reads, His mischief 
shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own plate. Psalms 94, 23. And that reads here. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity, and it shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. Proverbs 11, 5 and 6. The righteous of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness or naughtiness. Naughtiness? Yeah, naughtiness. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. 29 and 16 of Proverbs as well. When the wicked are multiplied, transgressions increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Which we can actually see that these are true in the case of Haman and Mordecai. And then the last one is Daniel 6 and 24. 6 and 24. Oh. So down here, the accusers fate so the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused daniel and they cast him into the dens of lions them their children and their wives the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den of the den so i don't know if you guys know the story of daniel um one of the king's closest i guess I don't even know what this guy was to the king. I think he was a eunuch or something like that. One of the king's close men, kind of like how Haman is to the king. Um, basically, I think it was a royal decree that they couldn't pray. And um, I think it was like a week or three days or something like that. And Daniel, he openly prayed. He didn't care. He didn't listen to the decree. So that guy had thrown him into the lion's den. And, uh, you know, Daniel went into the lion's den terrified, but he prayed. So God protected him for those nights that he was in the lion's den. The king was sad because he was also friends with Daniel. But once the king makes a decree, they cannot revoke that, which we will get into chapter 8 shortly. Um, but when the king makes a decree, it cannot be revoked, especially if it's signed by him. So the king himself was very sad with what happened to Daniel because Daniel became one of his best friends. And um, so after so many sleepless nights, he went to basically get daniel out of the den and he was hoping that daniel was safe he opened up the den and realized that daniel was alive and well and he got angry with the guy and then the other guy was thrown into the den hopefully that just made sense if you guys don't know the story read daniel 6 it'll, it'll tell you everything so daniel chapter 6 um will explain everything to you it is start off with the plot against daniel the royal decree and then how Daniel just did not care, the accusations against him, him being thrown into the lion's den, how the king couldn't sleep because they were like, the, they were like, I don't want to say best friends, but they were really close people to one another. And then um, his protection, how Daniel was protected from the lion through God. And um, then what happened, which I just read to the accusers, which they were thrown into the den and killed. So, that's that. Um, and the last one. For verse 10. It says, And the wrath of the king abated. So, Haman's death satisfied, satisfied the wrath of the king. You can see this in the case of Mordecai and Haman. Okay, so I'm going to get into the part. Okay, so basically, let me write this first because this is something I did want to talk about quickly. So, Haman's death satisfied the king's wrath all right so that's the first point now I'm going to take the positions of Mordecai and Haman and Put it in a way that you guys will be able to understand it in New Testament kind of understanding. So, in the case of both Mordecai and Haman, you can basically see it as the guilty, which is... 
Okay, let me grab the other Bible because I don't want to say this wrong because I think it's very important. But I don't even know which Bible it was in. I think it was this Bible. Let me see. Let me see. I just don't want to say it in a wrong way. I really want you guys to get it. Or was it on something else? Let me see. Sorry, Tanya. I'm gonna read your um your comment in a sec in a second. I just saw it as I was on my computer. I'm gonna get to that real quick. I just want to find this quickly for you guys because I don't want to say this wrong because it's very very crucial, very crucial. And when I looked it up and found it, I was astounded. Um, okay. And we're on chapter 7, not 8. So let me go to 7. I think it was from here that I got that note. Let's scroll down. Let's scroll down. Yes, okay. So this is still for verse 10. So it says from my notes, The death of a substitute satisfied the wrath of the king. In the case of Mordecai and Haman, it was the guilty dying in the place of the innocent. So the guilty being Haman was dying um, for the innocent one, which was Mordecai. So in the case of us and Jesus, it is a matter of the innocent dying in the place of the guilty. So the innocent person being Jesus died for the guilty ones, which is us. But for Mordecai and Haman, it was the guilty dying for the innocent so the roles get reversed in the new testament when jesus comes about i hope that just made sense <laughs> but the note is definitely in um the printable i don't want to do that i didn't want to do that so i'm gonna write this out quickly and then we're gonna finish it chapter 7 so this first off let's highlight okay I'm sorry guys, I just wanted to quickly write this. Okay, so, then the wrath of the king abated was the last part in verse 10. So Haman's death satisfied the, the king's wrath. This was the guilty, which is Haman, dying in place of the innocent, which was Mordecai. But for us, and as far as the New Testament, it's a matter of the innocent, Jesus, dying in place of the guilty, which is us. So, yes. That's what I wanted to say. And that is basically it for chapter 7. Um, I will say that chapter 7 is basically all about God delivering the Jews from Haman's evil plan. And um, that for all of Haman's scheming, plotting, and his pride, he became weak, inferior, and terrified. He thought too much of himself and he never really imagined himself falling from the grace of man. But... Um, with man, the grace you receive from them can never sustain you. Esther and Mordecai, on the other hand, had God's grace, so God was able to sustain them and preserve them. Esther had favor from God, and no one could mess with that. God had his hedge of protection surrounding his people. Um, even when it looked like 
they would be annihilated. God is basically a provider and a protector. And this also lets me know that fasting and praying ensures the victory that I need. So there are some things that you need to combat through fasting and praying, which we do see that when Jesus teaches it in the New Testament. And um, this is proof that I don't think that if Esther had actually fasted and prayed and had done this um, as a unit, as a community with her people, I don't think they would have gotten the same results. I honestly don't. So this definitely tells me that there is a key to you fasting and praying for certain things when it looks like you personally can't get it done. But yeah, that's it for chapter 7. So let me just... put this down because I want to fix this note um, and get to you guys' comments. Um, no. Oh, okay. And quickly, before I continue, let me know. Do you guys want me to do to stop this live and then just start another live specifically for Chapter 8? Or do you want me to keep going on this live? Um, let me know. So that I can figure out what to do. Because if, if I restart the live, it's not going to be like with the prayer and stuff. I'm just going to start off with chapter 8 so that I can be in a separate video. So, um, I guess you can say, uh, just tell me if you want a separate video or continue. So that I know. And I know you guys get this. Um, what I'm saying now, you get a few seconds behind. For some reason, it lags. Don't know why. But um, let me know. And Tanya... Tanya, what was those old verses for? Uh, 7.16. Oh, for, um, for verse 10? Those verses that you shared, um, was that a list for, oh, for verse 9. Sorry, okay, I just saw it, Tanya, so, okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Alright, guys, so I'm gonna keep going. Because a lot of you guys are just saying keep going. <laughs> so I think I'll just put a time stamp um, for when I do, when I start chapter 8. For those who watch it on YouTube or watch it later as a replay. I'm just fixing these notes. I'll fix the notes afterwards. Okay, so we're going to continue. Um, it's 1145. We're going to jump into chapter 8 now. And chapter 8 I titled Making Your Mark. Yes, yeah, I did um, here on um, the little... Uh, before I started the live, I put chapter 7 and 8, but um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was cool with that. Um, so I'm just going to continue, and then when I post it up to YouTube, I'll uh, put a timestamp so people can skip ahead if they want to skip, I guess. But, yeah. I Yeah, I have um, thought about Periscope. I actually love Periscope. I've watched a few other people using Periscope. I'm thinking about utilizing that one as well. Um, probably like having my other phone open on Periscope while I have my cell phone open on Facebook and then uploading one of the two to YouTube. But yeah, I definitely do want to utilize Periscope um, and also Instagram Live a lot more. But, you know, I'm, I still get nervous when I make my videos, especially when they're live because um, you can't edit them. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 